So welcome, Dr. Barbara McKay, to Stories Lived, Stories Told. It's very nice to be here. Thank you. So I'd love to jump right in with our first question. How are you arriving to this conversation today? Uh, with excitement and uh, a lot of energy, because I know the topic they're going to talk about is very dear to my heart. So um, yes, a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of interest. Excellent. Well, I am excited to be arriving to this conversation as well with lots of curiosity for everything that you're going to teach me today. Tell us the story of your academic and professional journey up to this point. Okay, it's quite an interesting one, actually. My first degree was in sociology, and I accidentally took sociology. I wanted to do something else. And for all sorts of complicated reasons, which I won't go into, I ended up doing sociology, which I found interesting, but completely perplexing. But during my time studying sociology, I was called to jury duty. And when I was on jury duty, I was a 19-year-old student, and the case that I was called on was what we used to call baby battering, so it was a child abuse case. And I suddenly realized that sociology was useful because I had some way of framing my understanding of what was happening in this situation, in this courtroom, and that inspired me to go into social work. And so I actually studied social work at master's level and uh, practiced as a social worker for many, many years. And as I became more experienced as a social worker, something very interesting happened. I was sharing an office with a systemic psychotherapist and I saw this woman wonderfully engaging people in conversation. I saw her connect with everybody in a way that just created so much energy and enthusiasm in the room. And I suddenly thought, I want to be able to do that. So I trained as as a systemic psychotherapist and worked with that woman for many years. And then I just progressed my training into systemic supervision and I ended up with a doctorate in systemic practice and that was my journey but each of my decisions had a turning point there was something that nudged me in a particular direction and I just think that's really inspiring when I'm working with people about what are the turning points that put you in a position where you go in one direction as opposed to any of the others you could take and so I'm really quite interested about the stories that people have of things like your educational journey and how come you're doing what you're doing. So it's great. Could you tell me a little more about that transition from sociology into the practice? Yes, I I went into into social work straight after my degree and uh, eventually trained as a social worker. I wasn't trained when I went into it. But one of the things that I was able to bring that I think was because of my sociology training was an understanding of societal ideas. So, you know, when we're thinking about what are the strongest influences in family life, or one of the strongest influences could be the kind of society or the community from which you come and the way that that society influences individual beliefs and family beliefs and creates traditions. And all of a sudden I had a a map about how I could understand the individual in the context of these bigger, more profoundly influential stories. Uh, And I found in my social work practice that to be able to see an individual or a family in that larger context was probably one of the most important things that I could do when I was trying to influence and create and collaborate with people on changing the direction of their lives. Did you see that as something unique that you were bringing to the field that not everyone else had that same perspective? Yeah, interesting. I'm not sure I would say it was unique. Many of my uh, colleagues that went into social work had psychology degrees, so they brought something slightly different. I think the beauty of it was that it was it was a way of thinking it was a way of it was a way of entering the world it was a way of me locating myself in in the work that i was doing and then with my social work colleagues who had psychology degrees they brought a different edge that helped me to see another layer of complexity in family life so i think it was a it was more of a um, a coming together of different uh, different traditions, different perspectives, different educational experiences that I think enriched my social work practice. Obviously, one of the concepts that you ran into was coordinated management of meaning. Where was that turning point in your story? How did that come in? 
oh, I can remember the day. And I can, t- it was in 1993. And I was training. This was the this was this was the point where I had been very strongly influenced by my colleague in the office, and I went to train as a systemic psychotherapist. And one of the things that I encountered at this particular training institute was a, a great interest in social constructionist ideas. And I had, in my social work qualification, interestingly, been more aware of psychodynamic ideas, and they didn't quite fit for me. And I think it was because of the relationship with power in those ideas. They just didn't quite work for me. And that's not a comment on any of the ideas. When I discovered sort of systemic ideas and social constructionism, it was a revelation. I suddenly had a way of thinking about my contribution to the world, the influences surround me, and it just just was a a wonderful way of understanding my world and my part in it. And when I was studying, uh, we had a week's intensive training with Barnett Pierce and Vernon Cronin, and it was a research week. Now, I had considered myself to be reasonably okay at academic stuff, but, you know, I was never going to be a researcher. I mean, that was for people in a completely different system to me. And during the week, we encountered CMM uh, as a set of ideas and a set of practices and a practical theory. And I was very engaged immediately with it. But a real turning point in that week was we had to come up in with in groups, we had to come up with a potential research project. And as a group, we came up with this really interesting research project. And Barnett, he would come around and he would work with each group. And he talked with us as, as a, a group. I can't remember what the, the topic was now, but he persuaded me that I could be a researcher, which then some years later inspired me to go on and actually do two or three pieces, small pieces, but pieces of research. So my initial introduction with CMM, I think probably was at a personal level. I saw it as contributing to my confidence as a person and the sense of you can really achieve things, you know, thinking about how you how you look at the influences around you, how you can take ideas from different places and how you can have confidence in your own voice. And that was the bit that got me really hooked. And then, of course, I went on to use it as a, as a practice in my clinical work. And then it came alive in a completely different way. It was profoundly important. And I had some very interesting experiences because the training institute that introduced me to these ideas sadly went into liquidation. And that was a you know, very, very profoundly sad moment for a lot of us. But at the time that that happened, I was actually a director of another training institute. And so I was able to invite Barnett and to invite Kim and the CMM. Institute and the Learning Exchange to come to my institute, the one that I represented. And so we rekindled after a a number of years, we rekindled the relationship. And Barnett and Kim came, I think, two or three times to do workshops in London at the institute where I was director. So I've always felt a very profoundly deep connection with the ideas, but also with Barnett and with Kim. Was that your first introduction to the CMM Institute as an institute, or have you been there from day one? No, I haven't. It's This is a recent development for me. Several years ago, it must have been in, what, 2005 or 2006, Barnett and Kim came and did a workshop. It might have been a little later because there was there was one time he came and did a workshop not long after his diagnosis, his cancer diagnosis. And he and Kim did a workshop on CMM as a spiritual practice and how we can use our CMM ideas in order to restore and refresh and respond to the challenges in our own lives. And it was incredibly moving. I mean, there was some remarkable little moments in that workshop. I remember saying to Barnett, I'm a little bit apprehensive because your audience was about 70 people. I said, most of them are social workers. They're frontline, really tough stuff. Mm. And I'm not sure at the moment, how are they going to hear these more thoughtful, reflexive, spiritual ideas? And I I couldn't have been more misguided. It was extraordinary. Barnett gave us a, a really interesting exercise He talked about moments of grace. It was a two-day workshop. And on the first day, he said, I'd like you to go out at lunchtime and I'd like you to wander around the streets of London and I'd like you to notice something that you don't usually notice. Just pay attention to it. Nothing more. Come back and tell us what you noticed. And on the second day, he said, I want you to go back 
around the streets of London, and I want you to create a moment of grace. I want you to engage with something that you don't usually engage with. And people came back and someone talked about someone that was trying to encourage us to give money to charity and he stopped and he talked to the person instead of disregarding him. There was a very large hospital close to, the, to this area and there was a patient who was very distressed someone went and talked with them and comforted them. There were these little glimpses of something really beautiful, beautiful moments, human moments. And after the workshop, several people went to Barnet and gave him gifts. And one of the gifts that he was given was a stone heart that had belonged to the participant's father. And he said something like, I want you to have this because you've, you've had such an impact on me over these two days and I'd like you to have it. There were little things like that that happened in the workshop that stunned me in, in a, this most glorious way. That I, and that was a kind of a real invitation into the world of CMM. And then after Barnett died, Kim maintained contact with me because Barnett said to Kim, you and Barbara need to meet. And so we met, we immediately connected, and she invited me to be a steward at the Institute. And so it's fairly recent, but it has a history and it has a journey. That's incredible to hear the activities that he was encouraging, because as I'm even writing my own little mini-sodes as I go on, where I come mm -hmm. to at the end of each one is I, it feels so natural to lead into some kind of call to action even if it's just pay attention to this. And I think that's what, that's how I interpret CMM. And so that's really cool to hear that from the beginning, that is the point. Yeah, that's lovely, isn't it? And it's, it's this idea, it's about embodied and embedded. You know, we're embedded in multiple levels of context. We're embedded in society's families and we embody the principles that we want to create with other people. So that idea of being coherent with the principles that you want to create with others so that the conversation that you have is bringing about something better. It's, it's extraordinary. It really is. Was that workshop with Barnett when you saw the impact that it had on your colleagues, was that your motivation to bring CMM into your work world? Certainly was. A, I think I'd been using it anyway in my therapeutic practice. I think when I saw the impact that it could have in social work, it's turned my attention in a slightly different direction. So one of the things that I started to do, and I still actually do pretty much exclusively, is work with children's social services departments to introduce them to CMM in order to improve their communication with children and young people and for the leaders to improve the way that they communicate with all of the people in the system. So using a CM, I, I love the phrase that Barnett used to use. He said uh, a CMM-ish approach. He was never wedded to the idea that it was a fixed right, set right. of ideas. Uh, and it, it was so freeing to say, use a CMM-ish approach. Use the attitude of CMM to introduce something into a conversation with leaders clients, whoever it might be, so that you, you you develop something with them that they didn't know they had the capacity to do before. And, and so that's where I spent a lot of my time. It was because I could see the difference it was making to social workers. Although my practice, my primary practice, um, I do work with social workers a lot with leadership groups, um, but I do have a private practice in individual couple and family work. And certainly CMM has uh, found its way into those practices in a very real and live way. Tell me more about how you integrate that into your couple's work. Well, I think with couples, I do, I do a lot of couple work and I do find it a real challenge because couples tend to come into therapy. Well, let me start in a different point. Couples don't come into therapy to tell, tell you they're doing great. Right. Couples come into therapy at the point at which something has gone quite badly wrong. So there's been an event that's transgressed some kind of rule, which is hard to recover from, which could be an affair or accessing porn or something like that. Or it could be that something that was thought to be cute when they first met has become an irritation as they've got older in their couple of relationships and that kind of thing. Or generally communication issues that, that a lot of couples say we have communication issues. 
I'm not quite sure what they mean when they say that, but I think they mean something like we've forgotten how to understand our partner well. And so when I'm thinking about CMM and couple work, I'm trying to join some really key systemic ideas with CMM. And so one of one of the key ideas I would be thinking of would be curiosity. So from a systemic point of view, I'm trying to get each partner in a couple to be profoundly curious about the other person's position, attitude, the way that they're understanding, the meaning that they're making of whatever conversation they're in, in order to be a little bit more attentive to how they make their next utterance, how they join the conversation, what they choose to say next. And what I found is that using uh, CMM and, and the kind of the basic ideas behind it about we all live our lives in a series of interconnected stories, and what we're trying to do is to make distinctions and connections in those stories, and we punctuate them. We try and make sense of small parts of it or small events or small episodes that tell us about a bigger picture. And so with couples, I'm trying to get them to take that meta position, to stand back from the event that they're in, to try and look at it from a different vantage point, a more affectionate vantage point, so that they can bring something new to their everyday routine conversation. Being able to ask couples, where do you get the idea that this is the kind of thing you should say when you're in this kind of moment with this partner? Where does that come from? And when you have that thought, what does that lead you to say and do? And when you say and do that, what effect do you see it having? And when you're seeing it have that effect, is that something that you enjoy? If it isn't, what alternative do you think you could bring? If I asked your partner, what might your partner suggest might improve things? Do you think that's something that you might be able to bring into the relationship? So what I'm able to do is use the CMM scaffold to look at individual beliefs, family beliefs, cultural beliefs, societal beliefs. So I talk a lot when I'm talking with couples, if I'm talking with heterosexual couples, we talk a lot about gender. And, you know, what are the gender stories in your family that enable you to have the couple relationship that you've got or constrain you from the couple relationship you want? Mm. And so these kinds of scaffolds with systemic curiosity, which is the idea of been generating questions. So a lot of the time in therapy, sometimes you can ask straightforward questions, you get straightforward answers. People are reporting, they're telling you a story of something. Now, you know, th that helps me because it informs me, but the couples generally don't learn anything. They just hear themselves saying things they've already said and they've already right. heard. Right. So when we're thinking about systemic ideas, we have to ask different kinds of questions because we have to synthesize and generate information because that's what creates change. So if you were looking at the world from your partner's point of view, what might it look like? If you were able to step into that position more often, particularly when you've got a disagreement, how might you handle it differently? So that synthesizes and it generates information. And then as soon as we can do something like that, we've got a platform for change. And so those, those things hand in hand just provide such a rich platform for having conversations with couples. That makes so much sense to me that therapy would be a place that CMM could be a really wonderful tool because like you said, maybe your clients are coming to you and saying, we don't know how to communicate. But they might not even mm -hmm. know what they mean by that, but CMM gives so much language to be yes. able to break that down. Okay, what does it mean that we don't communicate with each other? And then build that curiosity and have the language to be able to express that mm -hmm. curiosity and how to go about changing that if there's that desire to change. That's absolutely right. And I think the other element that you've just reminded me of in CMM, you know, what we're talking about here is CMM helps us to understand the moral positions that people hold in relationships that they're mm -hmm. in. The drivers that sometimes propel people into conversations that intellectually they don't really want to have. They, they mm. know it's not going to work well, but there's something that's pushing them. And, you know, one of the ideas in this is about the perceived oughtness. You know, I am a person. So, for example, if you have a couple and someone in the couple criticizes their partner, their partner might think I'm the kind of person that has to defend myself against criticism, because if I don't, I'm going to feel downtrodden. 
And so what they might do is they stand up and they argue back or they shout or they do something. And because their moral obligation says, I'm a person that has to do this. And then what occurs is it ends up with a big argument or something that they didn't really want to achieve. And so then we've got to think in our therapy work, when you feel that you want to do something, respond in that kind of way, and you already have an idea that it's not going to work out well, how can you stand up for yourself in a way that doesn't create that potential? What can you say to your partner if you have the experience of being criticized, whether he or she intended it? What could you say to your partner at that point that enables you to create something different together when you have a difference of opinion? So that would be the implicative force, the force that says, I can do something better with my partner in order to create a more harmonious future relationship. CMM helps us to understand how come people get into the tangles they get into with all of these moral orders and the perceived oughtness and the way that we make meaning of other people's interactions without asking them their intention. And it also helps us to introduce the potential for change through questions that brings about something better. And I think that for me, that's such a hopeful approach to couple work. And it's a, you know, it's about appreciating the efforts that people are making, even when it goes wrong. And that's what CMM does. It gives us those kinds of abilities to bring into the, into those conversations. I wonder if what you see too, is a lot of people forgetting that they could do anything different when they're so deeply embedded in habits or narratives that they've internalized from family structures or yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's an excellent point. I guess the other thing that it draws me toward is thinking about patterns. People get into uh, what Barnett used to call unwanted repetitive patterns. So one couple that I was working with, one partner wanted to remain connected with a previous family. And every time that partner wanted to go and see the children from that previous family, his current partner felt abandoned. And so what she would do was metaphorically pursue him. She would say, why are you going there? What are you doing? Why can't you stay here? We've got stuff to do. And she would metaphorically pursue. And the more she pursued, the more determined he was to go and attend to his previous family. And the less likely he was to turn toward her to comfort. So they got into a pattern of pursue and withdraw. And the more she pursued, the more he withdrew, and the more he withdrew, the more she pursued. So what CMM helps us with is these is deconstructing these unwanted repetitive patterns that for some couples seem completely irresistible. And it's because they they feel obliged to do something in the context of previous experiences or previous relationships that gets played out in their current couple relationship. And I remember asking one couple for whom this pattern just seemed impossible to relinquish. And I remember saying to them, I was trying to do something surprising to get them to really think. And I said to them, if you weren't having these It's kind of push me, pull you tangles that take a lot of your attention and energy. How would you know that you were a couple? And they were very stunned by that. And I said, how would you, how, where would the excitement be in your relationship if you weren't doing this? And what they realized, interestingly, was this push me, pull you pattern was lively, engaging, exciting, didn't have the outcome they wanted, but it had all of the features of of the excitement that they were longing for. So we shifted those kinds of ideas away from this particular pattern and asked how they could reintroduce some of the excitement into their relationship without following a pattern that was unhelpful. CMM helps us to do stuff like that, which I think is remarkable. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that example of the pursue flee dynamic is one a lot of people could relate to in a number of different types of relationships, that imbalance of power, or if you're always the pursuer could lead to that breakdown in communication that you maybe see. Oh. Yes. And if if it's possible, just to take a, a few moments and, and frame things differently. So uh, let's just think about that example of the pursue withdraw. You know, in, in working with people using these ideas, I might say to someone, if if you 
if you are able to see your partners pursuing as an attempt to draw you into family, because that's something that he or she hadn't experienced before, how might you think of your withdrawing practices? Or if I said to the other person, if you could see these withdrawing practices as an attempt to show you what an excellent parent your partner is to a previous family, which will give you confidence when you have your own family, how might you see your pursuing practices differently? So putting different frames around exactly the same behavior to bring, again, the, the CMM idea about meaning making, to bring a different meaning to the same action means that we can, we change the meaning, which then changes the action. And it's very powerful, very powerful. So you have written about cosmopolitan communication. So I could, have. Could you tell us about that and maybe a little bit more about how that plays off that role of curiosity? Yes. I, I mean, cosmopolitan communication is a sort of curiosity plus, plus, plus. Cosmopolitan communication, in from my point of view, it's about promoting with the couples that I work with the ability not just to hear the things that their partner is offering, but to enter their hearing with profound curiosity. Couples will say, well, I heard you say that, but they don't respond to their hearing of it. They kind of, they go on with their own merry pattern. So cosmopolitan communication, take a few different positions. The first thing it says is that differences of opinion between people is usual. We don't need to think of it as dysfunctional. That's one thing that I try to introduce into all of the work that I do. When people begin to think of their communication as problematic or dysfunctional, I would say it always has a logic. We just haven't yet worked out what that logic might be. Mm -hmm. And so cosmopolitan communication says, let's not think of communication as problematic. Let's think of it as people just miss one another sometimes. And what we're trying to do is to enable people to make use of that tension in order to be creative in order to be inspired to do something different, rather than use that tension to create conflict or disappointment or all of those other things that might develop in a couple relationship. And so from a, a therapist point of view, I need to be able to embody these cosmopolitan forms of communication in order to demonstrate the kind of ideas that I'm wanting them to embrace. So I will use phrases like compassion. I will ask questions like, when is it that you have been kind to one another? If more compassion was in your relationship, what would you be doing more or less of? If people around you, your family members or extended family or friends could give you one piece of advice for you to recover into your couple relationship, what might they be inspired for you to try? And so it's, it's from an appreciative stance. It's trying to develop conversations with couples based on their abilities and their willingness to step into something new. And through that, being profoundly open to the world of the other. From your understanding, what it, what's the connotation of cosmopolitan? What's the cosmopolitan part of cosmopolitan communication? It's about that recognizing that there are different forms of communication and recognizing that if we choose to use a social constructionist form of communication where we know that we make our relationships, we don't describe them, we make them, then it enables people to think about the contribution they make to the relationship that they're in. And I think that's something that's unusual because it, it shifts from a transmission model of communication to a construction model of communication, from linear to circular and relational. And I think if we can invite people into that kind of the world of responsibility for the part they play, then I think they're more inspired to do something better. I'm always thinking about responsibility. I'll just give you a little example when couples, if, if there's an event like an affair, which is very common in couple work, what I'm listening for, and this is in cosmopolitan communication, I'm listening for certain kinds of language that help me to know how to usefully intervene. And so with this kind of event, sometimes couples give accounts, they give an account of an event. And one account could be an excuse account. That's a little bit like, well, you know, it wasn't my fault. The opportunity was there. I just took it. 
that's an excuse account. Mm -hmm. yeah? Another account could be a justification account. It's, well, our relationship was in bad shape. So, you know, anyone in my position would look for something else. That's a justification account. What I'm looking for is a concession account. So a concession account is, I did it. It was my fault. I was responsible. Mm. I am sorry. What can I do to make up? And so again, cosmopolitan communication helps us to track these nuances in people's utterances, because all of these nuances, as you can imagine, the excuse account and the justification account aren't usually satisfactory to the person that's been very badly hurt. So we're looking to encourage the kind of accounts that create repair. And the concession account is the one that generally creates the platform for repair, because we can start to talk about what is it that you think your partner would welcome as a gesture of a turning point in your relationship? Would you like them to give you some ideas? And there's another account, which is giving no account. So some people will say, it's over, didn't mean anything, don't want to talk about it. And again, not usually satisfactory. Right. So cosmopolitan communication in CMM helps us to track the turn by turn utterances within which people create meaning. And we can intervene to question the utterances and to invite a different understanding of them or a different turn in the conversation. I think you're in a very unique place with CMM seeing people use it in their own personal life because you're, mm -hmm. you're using it in a professional sense, but for yeah. the people you're working with, you're making it very personal. Would you be willing to tell us some about how you see CMM showing up in your personal life? I definitely will. And, uh, and this is a question that I am absolutely delighted to answer. And I'll tell you why. Uh, a colleague of mine called John Burnham, he and I wrote a chapter on supervision, but the principles of what I'm going to share with you called relational integration. And what we were trying to develop here is that our personal and professional stories intersect and that there will be experiences from our personal lives that find their way into our professional practice and experiences in our professional practice that find their way in our personal lives. And so one of the things that we talked about and, and we wrote about, and many of my clients will know this of me, I'm a very open therapist. My clients will know that I am the mother of an adult daughter and an adult son, and I am the grandmother of two granddaughters and a grandson. And so one of the experiences that I'm really passionate about are gender stories. Being a woman myself, I, I started to wonder how come gender seemed to be so significant for me, as opposed to other aspects of my experience. So education is important, but not as important as gender. My mm. class, I'm working class history, important, not as important as gender. So yeah. how come? And so I used CMM to think about my own family. And what I learned about my own family, and I had the great privilege of actually presenting this at a conference, was that I come from a long line of determined women who were extremely able, but had no opportunity. Mm. Because the men in my particular community went out to work and the women were homemakers and men were providers. It was very traditional. I saw all of these talented women whose dreams were never realized. And my mother was an extremely bright woman and had to leave school early because they didn't have the finances to enable her to stay. And she was determined that I would have a different future. So she was the one that encouraged me without really knowing very much about universities or any higher education. She encouraged me in, into those directions, which took me away from my family, but created the opportunities for me as a woman that women before me had not had. And so what I find is that when I'm working with women who have had some kind of subjugating experience, whether it be through violence or through disadvantage or through the discourses of gender that are still alive and well about inequality, I find that I'm very motivated to explore these kinds of things at societal level. And again, that's what CMM helps me with. It helps me to think, what's the societal view about gender? 
And how does this client that I'm talking to, how has she found herself inadvertently restrained or constrained by the discourses of gender around her? How can I ask her some questions about her aspirations of womanhood in a way that will enable her to see that there's another possibility? So CMM has changed my understanding of myself and my understanding of myself then influences the way that I act in my practice. That's certainly one of the ways that I've seen CMM show up in my own life as well. And I too, I think like you find it empowering to look through that lens. Absolutely. It's interesting because there's something in one in my family at the moment where people in my family have young children. And one of the things that I'm very struck by is it still tends to be the females in the family that do the organization around what's going to happen with the children even though everybody in the, in the system is working full time. And, and one of the things that I constantly talk about is how come, despite the fact that we have more opportunities in employment and education, when it comes to domestic home life, the discourses of gender seem to be more readily available. How do we manage to do that? How do we as women still take responsibility for not just the practical things in family, but the emotional well-being of our families? How have we been persuaded that it's our job? Right. When there's not the critical thinking, you fall yeah. back to that default, which is the, that being a woman's role. Yes. Yeah. And, and I, I just think, again, you know, if we think CMM, if we think at the level of life script, when we're thinking about the CMM structures, you know, to be able to ask questions that help us to deconstruct how we have fallen into certain habits without questioning. You know, a discourse is a strongly held belief that escapes scrutiny. Mm, right. So what, what we try to do, what I try to do uh, when I'm working with people is scrutinize the beliefs because CMM is all about beliefs, meaning, action, and emotion. And so if we can scrutinize the beliefs, we can inquire about the action, and we can also pay attention to the emotional consequence that people encounter when they try to do something very different or when they're repeating a pattern that's frustrating. So, you know, we've got these glorious connections between meaning, action, and emotion that just give us a route in to pretty much every kind of idea that you want to encounter and you want to discuss. How has your relationship to CMM changed over time, mm -hmm. but also how have you seen CMM itself change? I think one of the things that I probably will just kind of return to is uh, I think over time, it's, it's about when Barnett said about a CMM-ish approach, I think it helped me and others to think that, that we didn't have to rarify these ideas. Not that I'm saying Va Vern Cronin and Barnett Pierce wanted to, they never did. But I think sometimes when we've got a theory that started out in an academic context, we sometimes imagine that they're not for everyday use. Yes. And I think, so I think one of the things that's been instrumental in me seeing it as an, the practical theory that they knew it was always meant to be was about using it with the couples and with the systems that I work with and, and you know, blending it with systemic ideas. It's just be some, become so practically fruitful. So that's something that I've noticed. And I think the, the other thing uh, that I think I, I've seen more of is uh, different board members using CMM and CMM ideas in such a variety of contexts that it's, I had limited my understanding of it to the therapeutic world because that's where I encountered it and that's where I trained in it. Now my horizon has been widened. I think that's what CMM does. It widens your horizons. Absolutely. But I think it really has widened my horizons <laughs> to see some of the incredible work that other people are doing using the same ideas that I imagined were, were for therapy. And so that's been an, a revelation. And I think that the next kind of turn has been, you know, part of the, the Institute has been, I come out of the meetings and I say, what a joy, what a wonderful way to spend an evening. They're people who enjoy being in conversation with one another. They are people that enjoy listening to innovative ideas and the way that you're trying things out. They're people that want to contribute. They want to enrich your life. They want to hear how you can enrich theirs. And it's a, the sense of community is it's tangible. It's a tangible sense of community. And I think from that, it's given all of us the confidence to write more. So the books that have been inspired by the Institute 
have put us all in positions where we think we can do something, which is back to what I was saying in 1993, when Barnett yeah. said, you could be a researcher. The CMM Institute has persuaded me I can be a writer. So all of those different things have really kind of emerged over time. Uh, and, and I think there are other things that, that really stick in my mind. I remember Barnett saying, change happens one conversation at a time. And when I'm in the board meetings with the CMM Institute, I see that happening in front of me. I see each utterance, each turn of conversation, building on the next one and expanding it and taking it in a new direction. People's imagination's been stimulated. And I think by being able to create that as a group of people who are interested in CMM, it gives me confidence that we can take it into all of our multiple contexts and do something very similar. So how has it changed? I think it's become more accessible. I think it's become more of a lived practice as opposed to a told practice. Mm. And I, th I think we all embody it in every relationship that we're in. So it's now becoming infectious. I can certainly see that. And I have felt very welcome into that community. And I can see the power that it has for the people that are in it. And I, I do think that's very special. It is. It, it really is. And I think, I, I think it, captures, it captures the spirit of CMM. It says we're all in there to build the kind of relationships that, with one another that we want to inspire others to build in a range of communities. And I think the level of excitement is also really interesting. You know, I think most of us are older people, but we still have the energy enthusiasm because we're excited. We're still excited by these ideas because they're not static. They're constantly developing, constantly changing and constantly emerging. And I think all of us keep looking around to see who's going to come up with another in innovative way to use these ideas. So, and that's lovely. So some theories, they become solidified and you use them as you use them because that's the way they're supposed to be used. With CMM, that doesn't happen. CMM is, it's about fluidity. It's about, you know, uh, emergence. It's about building on the conversation that you're in as opposed to having the conversation planned before you go into it. It's a, it's a different mindset. It's really interesting. In your work, do you, do you say literally coordinated management, a meaning this is CMM, this is what I'm showing you, or are you using the tools without getting into that deeper theory? Yeah, I usually, what I usually say is there's a communication perspective that I think you might find useful. Would you like to give it a shot? And most people say yes. You know, most people aren't going to say, no, keep it to yourself. You know, right, you know right. we'd rather have something really boring. Mm -hmm. So most people would say yes. And I, I tend to use that phrase more. It's a communication perspective. And it helps us to look at communication in a different way. Because traditionally, we think if I've said something in a language that you understand and you've understood every single word, then that's good communication. This looks at communication in a different way. It helps us to realize that we're using our own meaning system to determine how to respond to someone else. So it's not straightforward. And that's sometimes why we get into tangles. I mean, Barnett said, it's not a mystery that people misunderstand one another. It's a complete mystery that we ever understand one another. Mm. Yeah, I usually say things like that to free people up yeah. To be able to, to, you know, back to this idea that communication is not dysfunctional. It has a logic. What we're trying to work out is what's the logic in order to help you to do something that you would prefer to do that would improve your relationship. I think that's a wonderful way that you're making CMM accessible to so many more people. Part of that, then I can see that what you're doing is bringing CMM to so many people. What are you trying to create in your social worlds, in all the social worlds that we've talked mm -hmm. about that, like we've said, overlap, of course, professionally, personally. Yes, they do. And it's interesting because I've got an example from today. I think one of the things that I do try to, to do is I try to pay very careful attention to my use of language. If, if I choose to adopt the position that language creates reality, which I do, then I have to think about the reality that I create through the language that I use. And so what I intentionally do is to pay very close attention to the way I phrase things, 
the way I invite people into conversation, the way that I respond to people. And I had a client this afternoon. I mean, she said, just let me write that down because I like the word, the, the phrase that you have used. And I, I think that what I'm trying to encourage people to do is exactly that. I'm trying to embody cosmopolitan communication. I'm trying to embody this social constructionist position to invite people to, to flirt with that world themselves and see what they find in there see what they can make. So attention to language, I think, is probably the key thing.